Good morning, friends, and welcome to the Pinnacle of Prophecy. We've been studying some of the most important prophecies found anywhere in the Bible. We want to welcome those who are joining us on the various networks across the country and around the world. We want to tell you about some great resources that will help you in your study of God's Word. First of all, before I share what I have here in hand, we cut our Q&A time a little bit shorter because it's a very important presentation but we want to remind you, if you like Bible questions and getting answers, we have a program every Sunday evening that Amazing Facts does called Bible Answers Live. It's 7 p.m. Pacific time, and it's on various networks and radio stations, and you can participate by calling in with your Bible questions. So again, that's Bible Answers Live every Sunday, 7 p.m. Pacific time. We have some free resources. The one is a very important sharing magazine. It's called America in Prophecy one of our more popular sharing magazines. If you'd like to receive this, a digital copy, all you have to do is scan the QR code that you see on your screen. You can also text the word AMERICA7 to the numbers 40544, and you'll be able to receive a digital download of the magazine. And of course, we know there are many who are watching outside of North America. If you'd like to receive it, just go to the website, pinnacleofprophecy.com. And then, as part of our series, we've got a set of 14 lessons. We've been studying through these lessons. I know many of you have uh, the lessons here in person. If those of you are watching would like to get a copy of today's lesson, just go to Pinnacle of Prophecy, and you'll be able to download the website. It's, less, it's lesson, I'm sorry, download the, the lesson. It's uh, lesson number 14, Satan's Mark or God's Seal. That is the topic. Very important presentation this morning. You can follow along. If you, those of you who are here, if you don't have a copy of the lesson, do not fear. We do have extra copies at the back. So on your way out, you'll be able to receive it if you don't have it with you right now. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come. And as mentioned, we have a very important presentation. I wanted to make sure that we give him enough time to cover all of the material that we have for today. So thank you, Pastor Doug. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Ross. And good morning, everybody. Good morning to our friends who are watching around the world. Actually, some places we know it's actually evening now. And welcome for those that are here for the uh, Granite Bay Hilltop Church. Just curious, how many of you are here in this facility for the first time? Can we see your hands? Oh, bless your heart. We're so glad to see each of you here. Praise the Lord. And uh, we just, we hope that you uh, are blessed by the experience today. This is the final presentation in our series dealing with the subject of the pinnacles of prophecy, uh, exploring Revelation 14 and all the different ramifications connected with this peak prophecy in the book of Revelation. Our study this morning is dealing with Satan's mark or God's seal. And I want to remind all of our friends that are tuning in, I will be going through a question-answer format as I share and teach. This is kind of teaching, preaching, speeching that I do. And uh, as I go through that, there'll be places for you to fill in answers. We do that because we find people remember the Bible verses better when they look them up for themselves and then they fill it in. And it also then gives you material where you can then share these studies with your friends. For those that are t tuning in for the same time, you go to the Pinnacle of Prophecy website, you'll find where you can download these or how you can order a whole set. Well, our study today is dealing with Satan's mark or God's seal. And the Bible is very clear that in the days ahead, ahead everybody is going to be marked one way or another. Some people always think, don't let anyone mark you in the last days. Well, you want to be marked with the right mark. Amen? Because everybody's got something in their forehead. A little amazing fact, I think we've all heard about facial recognition software. It's becoming extremely sophisticated and uh, right now they can use it to you know, monitor people coming and going find criminals who are just walking down the street they even snap pictures of people that are in their cars uh, from some public roads and they'll identify folks that have been running uh, they've got more cameras in China to monitor the behavior of their citizens than any other country quite a few in England as well but um, it's just becoming ubiquitous when I uh, check onto a plane now, they, I go and they scan me on these international flights. I look at things, it looks at your eyes, it does both an iris and a facial scan. Coming back this year into the country, I've got something called global entry where I get to go back in a little quicker. I used to use fingerprints, 
Never did work very well because my fingerprints are kind of worn off. I used to sell firewood. But um, now they do facial recognition. And when I tried to get back into the country last time, they said, please step aside. I said, no, it's really me. And the guy looked at me. He looked at the picture. He looked at his report. He said, you shaved your mustache. <laughs> I said, uh, yeah, actually, I did. <laughs> it picked that up. I thought I was an imposter. So, yeah. Well, in the last days, God has got some special recognition software, and he's going to look down, and he's going to know who are his and who are not his. There will only be two groups, the saved and the lost. Friends, there are only two roads. Jesus said there's the broad way to destruction, and there is the narrow straight gate to his kingdom. You want to be on the right road. What's really frightening is there's a lot of people who think they're on the right road, and they're not. Jesus will declare to them, many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, they know his name. We've done many wonderful works. We've taught in your streets. We've cast out devils. He'll say, I do not know you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness, iniquity. We want to make sure we are not self-deceived. Amen? Amen? Speaking of the beast power, 2 Thessalonians, it says, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not a love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God sends them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. They believe it. We need to know what is the truth, friends. All right, our passage we're using as a springboard from Revelation 14 is verse 9 and 10. It says, A third angel followed them, saying, With a loud voice, that's megaphone in Greek, if anyone worships the beast, it's a warning from the heavens and his image and receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand, tells us in Revelation 13, in the right hand. He himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God that is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. It's the most fearful pronouncement of curse and God's displeasure found in Scripture. We want to know what that mark is and avoid it. Even more important, we want to know what God's seal is. That's what our study is about. Amen? We've told us along the way the key to understanding these prophecies in Revelation are the stories in the Bible. Out of 404 verses in Revelation, 278 are found in the Old Testament. That's where the keys are. You go back to the very beginning. Adam and Eve had two sons, originally Cain and Abel. And Cain was a keeper of sheep. I'm sorry, Cain was a tiller of the ground. Abel was a keeper of sheep. God had instructed them that for the sacrifice for sin, it required the death of a lamb. Well, Abel did what was required. Fire came down from heaven on Abel's altar. It was accepted. Cain thought, well, that's kind of messy. I'm a farmer. I'll bring my offering. He's a shepherd. So he brought some fruits or vegetables from the ground, and nothing happened, just fruit flies. And he got upset with his brother. And Abel said, Cain, I know you're the older brother, but you need to obey God. God didn't say do it that way. We need to do it the way that God says. He's told us how to worship him and how to appeal for forgiveness. It can't be based on your works. And he got so upset with his younger brother remonstrating with him he finally flew into a rage and killed his brother. The one doing it wrong persecuted the one doing it right. They both were worshiping the same God. One true, one false. Same thing happens in the last days. Those who worship the beast in his image are doing it wrong will persecute those who are doing it right. It's been the same issue through time. It's like the battle of Elijah on Mount Carmel said who is the real God if Baal is the God worship him build an altar let's see where the fire comes where's the power a lot of people have a form of religion with no power but the power is in the word friends it's in Christ so soon everybody is gonna have a mark one way or the other we will either have the seal of God father's name written in the forehead or the mark of the beast in the hand or in the forehead Cain, Cain got a mark placed on him. If you know, that's the first time you find that in the Bible. Cain said, my punishment is too great for me to bear. Future generations will kill me. God placed a mark on Cain, warning nobody 
to kill him. He was marked, but it was a mark of his sin to protect him from the wrath of man. And uh, you can see where Goliath got marked in the forehead, didn't he? Stone from David. Ezekiel 9 talks about a mark. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But if you read in Psalm 37, verse 37, it says, Mark the blameless man and observe the upright man, for the end of that man is peace. So when you say mark a man, it doesn't mean run up and put a big check on their forehead. It means take note of that man. Everybody's going to be marked and filled with one of two spirits. Question number one. Let's get to the lesson. <clears throat> it says in the question, how are we to worship God? Well, there are two different ways that God is often worshipped. You got the false way where they obey the traditions of man. It says, in vain they worship me, Jesus said, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. They're just man-made commandments. They're following traditions and putting aside the commandments of God. That's why a lot of churches, even those who claim to be Christian churches, do it. Hey, I've got a free prophecy for you. Totally disconnected but connected. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man. What's a woman represent in prophecy? Saying, we will wear our own apparel, we will eat our own bread, only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. Talking about in the last days, you've got all these churches, they want his name, they want to call themselves Christian, but they said, we'll wear our own apparel, our own righteousness, we'll have our own interpretation of the word, but we want to call ourselves Christians. That's where we're at today. You know, the Christian church is the most divided religion in the world. Now, there are many divisions of Islam and there are divisions of Judaism, but Christianity takes the cake. Hundreds of denominations. How do you know where to go? Do you think that's the kind of church Jesus is coming back for? Or is he going to pull people together based on the word in the last days? Things are going to be shaken in our world. People are going to be driven to God. The devil's going to exploit that fear to make religious laws that are wrong and God is going to allow these trials to draw his people back to his word and back to a unity among believers. You're going to see that happening. How do we worship God? God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and in T-R-U-T-H truth. It is the truth that sets you free. Truth matters friends. We're living in a world where everyone's got this relative truth. They don't believe in absolute truth. And God's truth is absolutely true. The Bible says, Jesus said, John 17, 17, Thy word is truth. The most important foundation for truth in the world is the word of God. It is the rock on which the wise man builds. Amen? Romans 6, in verse 16, Paul tells us, Do you not know... That to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves to whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. You've got two kinds of people. Those that are hearers of the word and they do it, and those that hear and do not do. The fool hears the words of Christ, but he doesn't do it. God wants us to not only be hearers, but doers of the word. Now, Pastor Doug, aren't we saved by faith? Yes. If you are saved by faith, it'll be seen in your actions. If you have believing faith, it will show. When Daniel came out of the lion's den, the Bible says there was no form of hurt on him. God delivered him because he believed in his God. How did Daniel show his belief? He would not disobey God's commandment and worship the king. Because he believed in God, it was seen in his life in action. Number two, who receives the seal of God? And who receives the mark of the beast? Let's find out what the Bible says. You can read in Revelation 7, verse 3, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the what? The servants, is what you fill in there, of our God in their where? Foreheads. They are sealed in their foreheads. Now, the Bible is telling us these angels are holding back the winds of strife. These winds of strife is telling us that terrible trials and calamity are about to come on the earth. And by the way, we haven't talked about it. There's so much more I have to say. But the time of trouble comes in two phases. 
The Bible talks about what we would call a small time of trouble that precedes the seven last plagues, which are the great, great time of trouble. And friends, I think we're on the verge of what we would call the small time of trouble. When those angels loose their grip, you're going to see all kinds of calamity in the world. Jesus said, a time of trouble such as there never has been since there was a nation, even unto the same time. And Daniel is, uh, Jesus is quoting Daniel uh, when he makes that statement in Matthew 24. Before that final calamity sweeps around the world, God seals his servants in the forehead. And the other seal is from the beast. If anyone does what? Worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, he himself will also drink the wine of the wrath of God that is poured out without mixture. That's that same verse we read earlier. So what is this seal? We want to know that. Matter of fact, I think it's more important that we know what the seal is than the mark. Because you don't want to be an expert in the mark and get the mark. You want to be an expert in the seal. Amen? I got some people come to my meetings. They ask all these questions about hell and the lake of fire. And I think you're way too preoccupied with that. Is that where you plan on going? So ask me more about heaven. Seal the law among my disciples. Okay, right there. If I were to stop, have you noticed the connection between the seal and the law? The seal of God can be found in the law of God, but there's more. Seal the law among my disciples. It says, these were the ones who were not defiled. It says they're not defiled, for they are virgins, for they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. It says they're not defiled with women, for they are virgins. It's left out of that verse, but I want to mention it. Um, the 144,000 are not defiled by the doctrines of of the whore of Babylon, of Babylon and her daughters. Now, it's, it's using this spiritual analogy. They're all women in this passage. It's talking about churches that are faithful to the word, that are undefiled from the corrupting influences of the wine of Babylon, is, is uh, what that's sharing. And furthermore, those with the mark of the beast will be following Satan. They are rebelling against God and his law. Now, you sort of already knew that. What does it say in Revelation 12, verse 17? The dragon, who's that? Satan was wroth. That's King James. Angry, furious. With the woman. What's a woman? True church or false church in this? It's got to be true because the devil's mad at her, right? It's a no-brainer. And he goes to make war. This is the battle of Armageddon. With the remnant, what's left of her seed, her descendants, her followers, that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Who is the devil especially angry with? The ones that still believe and teach and keep the command commandments, not to be saved, but because they love the Lord. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen? All right, so we know the devil's angry with the group that are surrendered and obedient. Number three, where are people marked? This is where it gets really interesting. Revelation 14, 1, Then I looked... And behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Well, it said the seal of God in their foreheads. Here it says their father's name in their foreheads. Now, this is a group that is saved, and they've got something in their foreheads. You know, you go to the average person on the street and say, you know, as we enter the last days, you've read Revelation, would you let anyone put anything in your forehead? And they go, no way. They think it's only the beast that's going to be marking. Everyone gets marked. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel. And uh, this will not be on the screen. If you don't have a Bible or a Bible on your phone, um, then just uh, listen carefully. A prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 9, and I, I can't read it all, but I want to especially read to you. Oh, well, let me see. I'll start with uh, if my pages will stop sticking together here. Oh, it's stubborn. There we go. All right, let's see. I'll start with verse uh, 3. Ezekiel 9, 3. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been. This is in the temple it's happening. To the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with a linen who had a writer's inkhorn at his side. Again, it's apocalyptic. It's got imagery in it. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. This is where God's people are. 
and put a mark on the forehead. Revelation is based on the Old Testament. Of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done in it. So the mark is being put on those that are grieved by the abominations and the sin. Abominations, remember, that's idolatry among other things. To the others, these other angels, he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not spare, nor have pity. Utterly slay old and young maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. Now, do you want that mark? That mark protects you against the judgment. Friends, you've read your Bibles. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, an angel of judgment went through the land. Only those that had the mark of the blood survived the judgment. When the children of Israel came into the promised land, Rahab, who was a Canaanite harlot, but she accepted Jehovah. <laughs> There's hope for all of us. Amen. She was told before Joshua comes and blows those seven trumpets. Where do you see seven trumpets? That's in Revelation 2, isn't it? Before Joshua comes and blows those seven trumpets, before the city is destroyed with fire and a shout, will there be fire and a shout? Will there be a great earthquake, Revelation says? She was to put a red rope in her window and everybody in her house was saved. Everybody in the house with the sign was saved. You want to have that sign in the last days, friends. We need to be under the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. We need to have the seal of God. We need His law written in our hearts. This is what it's talking about. And then it goes on to say, and begin at my sanctuary. Judgment must begin at the house of God, Peter says. And if judgment begins at us, what will be the end of them that obey not the gospel? So there's even a judgment that starts for those who should know better in the church. You're hearing the truth. This is what Revelation is talking about. There's so many fairy tales about this out there. It's just, it's, it's uh, sickening to see so many people deceived about what the Bible's really saying. All right, Revelation 14.1. I looked and I saw, actually, I'm on Revelation 13, verse 16. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, Notice it said right hand there. That no one might buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So, the, the beast's power, it's going to affect not only individuals, it's going to affect nations. What do you call it when one nation or the United Nations or the European Union tells other nations that you cannot buy or sell or do business unless you change your behavior? economic sanctions do we already in the world today have nations imposing economic sanctions on other nations because they're not cooperating so we already see that happening but it will not only be something inflicted on nations that don't cooperate with the beast it's going to go down to the individual level where you can't buy or sell and folks are wondering well how will that be monitored you know, they got these RFID chips that they, they put it in a dog and you can track your dog and you got them in your credit cards and now there's some workers that have them put here in their hand when they go to the office. Now, I haven't, you know, whenever I go to the Amazing Facts office, all these buildings have got security. I've just got a white card. It's got a chip in the card. And I don't want anything in my hand. We're not offering that. Don't worry. And, and uh, you know, but everyone's using these things now, right? But now some people are having them implanted because no one can steal your identity. And they're going to go to a bank. They're even using facial recognition at the bank. These mechanisms and technologies, they are not the mark of the beast. They may be used to control buying and selling. I just want you to know how easy is it going to be for them to control it. If you are not cooperating with the beast and worshiping the day and the way you're being told, and you go to the market and you check out and it says, uh, it's coming up that your card is not working. Your pin is not working. Oh, you've been flagged with your facial recognition. Sorry, no purchase today. Are, are we far from that? No, we can know that can happen. They'll be marked. What does it mean, hand and forehead? It is not a tattoo. I am so grieved. There are Bible translations. They're not translations. They're paraphrase. And in, in Revelation 13, it says he causes all to get a tattoo in the right hand or forehead. That is a total abuse of what the original language says. 
When it's talking about a mark in the hand or in the forehead, let the Bible interpret itself. Can you say amen? amen? How does God use that language in the Bible? That's how we need to apply it. It's talking about in your thoughts and in your actions. Number four, is the mark of the beast in the seal of God a physical, visible mark? No. Now, there may be visible changes in the life, but they're not going to walk around with a tattoo that says 666 in their forehead. I mean, do you think the devil's dumb? Right now, if some government said, all right, everyone line up, we're going to you know, get a rubber stamp and stamp 666 on your forehead, everyone get in line, who would do that? And so, but there are Christian churches that are telling their people, make sure don't let anyone put 666 in your forehead and you're home free. That has nothing to do with it. And the real thing is happening right under their noses. What does the Bible say? Exodus 13, verse 9. And it shall be a sign on your hand and the memorial between your eyes. That's the Hebrew way of saying forehead. That the Lord's law may be in your mouth. In order for the law of the Lord to be in your mouth, it needs to first be in your heart. Because Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that's the new covenant. We're saved by the new covenant. What's the new covenant? I will write my law in their hearts. And if the law of God is in your hearts, will it be seen in your life? Will you be just a hearer or a doer of the word? There you have it, hand and the forehead. But there's more. Wait, I want to give you another one. Exodus 13, 16. This is not on the screen, but just you can look it up. It'll be a sign on the hand and as frontlets between your eyes. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So there's a second testimony. Here's a third testimony, Deuteronomy 11, verse 8. Two witnesses ought to do it, but I'm going to give you four. Therefore, you shall lay up these words in your heart and in your soul. Now, when it says in your heart, laying up the word in your heart, is Moses saying you're to get a surgeon to make an incision in the chest and stick Bible pages in there? No. How many know that's a figure of speech? Okay. Lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. And they'll be like a sign on your hand. There you got the word sign. Are you listening? And they'll be frontlets between your eyes. That means forehead. Deuteronomy 6 verse 8. This is another free one. You have to look it up. After God gives the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5, immediately after that, it's all one discourse. Moses repeats the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5. He says in Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And these words that I command you this day, he's just given them the Ten Commandments, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you lie down. You shall talk of them when you rise up, when you walk by the way. And it says, you shall bind them for a sign on your hand, and they will be as frontlets between your eyes. All right, friends, I've just given you four verses, and there are more that explain what does it mean, a mark in the forehead in the hand. It is not a tattoo. It's talking about having the law of God in your heart and in your actions. Those in the last days that do not have the law of God in their heart and their actions will have the mark of the beast in their actions. They'll be obeying the laws of the beast. And it'll act, hand is the actions, mind is in the heart and the affections. Is that making sense? Let's look at more. Hebrews 10.6, what does God say? I will put my law where? In their minds. If you've got the seal of God, the Holy Spirit in your heart, the law of God will be in your mind. Amen? The forehead is what's between our eyes. It's a symbol of our thoughts. The hand is a symbol of our actions. A lot of examples of this. I've got one I just pulled up here in 1 Samuel 26, 18. And David is saying to King Saul, Why does my Lord pursue his servant? What have I done? What evil is in my hand? That didn't mean he had something evil in his hand. I mean, it's in my actions. I've not done anything to hurt you. And when you say to your friend, Can you give me a hand? You don't cut it off and toss it to him. You all know what that means, right? That's why they call it manual labor. This is mano in Spanish, right? It means it's talking about your actions. You do your actions. You do your work with your hands. So some will do the works of the beast. Some will believe the beast. It may not be just in their actions, but it's in their, their thoughts. Others will cooperate because they want to get fed, but they don't really believe it. 
but they're complying with the laws of the beast. They're selling their souls. And that's what this slide is dealing with. Some people will be deceived. Revelation 13, 14, they'll serve the beast. They got the mark in the forehead. They really believe the lies of the beast. Others will cooperate because of threats. They don't want to be killed and they want to buy and sell. So they do the works of the beast, but it's just in their hand. It's not in their hearts and their head. Number five, how are people sealed by God? We want the seal. Amen? Ephesians 4, verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How many want to be redeemed? By the way, Paul also says this in Ephesians number 1, sealed by the Holy Spirit. So first and foremost, when we talk about the seal of God, it is the Holy Spirit. Right? I mean, how many of you realize those that have the mark of the beast have the spirit of the devil? You don't, don't get that? Come on. <laughs> Cooperate. Yeah, just, you're going, I'm not raising my hand no matter what he says. <laughs> Do you all understand that those that have the seal of God have the Holy Spirit? All right, so everybody who has the seal of God has the Holy Spirit. So first and foremost, you've got to have the Spirit of God. There's not going to be anybody that will be obeying any laws that's getting to heaven if they don't have the Holy Spirit. You must be born of the water and the Spirit if you would enter the kingdom of heaven. So that is a foundational truth, right? But there's something more specific in it. Bind up the testimony. I read this. Seal the what? The law among my disciples. The Spirit of God will do what? The New Covenant writes the law in our hearts. It's the Holy Spirit. People asked a question earlier, how can I give up sin when I love it so much? When you're baptized by the Holy Spirit, He changes your heart. Things that you once loved, you will hate, and things you once hated, you will love. You become a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are made new. The Holy Spirit does that for us when we invite Him into our lives. First and foremost, God's servants are sealed by the Holy Spirit, the member of the Godhead who writes the law of God upon our hearts so that we might reflect Christ's sinless image. You can read in Ezekiel that where it says, I'll put a new spirit within them in Ezekiel chapter 36 and in 2 Corinthians 3.18, many passages make this clear. But when we use the word seal, what are we talking about? What is a seal biblically? Notice you'll find the seal uh, it tells you in Ezra 1, verse 1 and 2, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that he made a proclamation through his kingdom. They sent it out with a scroll, and he put it in writing, and here's what the proclamation said. Thus says Cyrus, king, Persia. There are three components to a seal biblically. Those three things are going to contain the official's name, his official title, and his territory. When the president gives a speech, I was at a speech one time and before he came out to his podium, they came out and they actually velcroed the presidential seal on the front of this podium. And varying with who the president is at the time, this one, it was George W. Bush, President, United States of America. It's got three things. If you look on the seal for Canada, uh, it used to say Queen Elizabeth, the second, now it's Charles, Queen, United Kingdom, Great Britain. It's got the name, the title, the territory. You still with me? What a seal is. When Jesus was put in the tomb, they were afraid that the body would be stolen, so Pilate said, all right, I'm going to give you some soldiers and I will seal it. You know what that seal said? Pontius Pilate, Governor, Judea. When Daniel was put in the lion's den, Darius put a stone over the den, and Daniel came out alive, and so did Jesus. Amen. He put a stone over it, and the government seal said, Darius, king, Medo-Persia. So here's the question, friends. Where in God's law do we find God's seal? Fourth commandment. Here's what it says in Exodus 20. For in six days the Lord, that word there is Yahweh, made that is the maker and creator of all the heavens and the earth and all that is in him he is the great one his name
who creates and sustains all things everywhere. In the Sabbath commandment. Now friends, right there in the middle of God's law, you've got the longest commandment, the only commandment that begins with the word remember. It's the last of the commandments between man and God. It's the commandment that bridges the commandments between our obligations to God and our obligations to our fellow man. You find a special commandment. You know, life is made of time. If you have no more time, you wouldn't be hearing me right now. We exist in time. You love in time. You don't have time with someone, something happens to love. God gave us sacred holy time to develop that love relationship. The devil hates that. He knows if he can destroy our quality love time with God, it erodes the relationship. Have you discovered that if you don't have time, it affects the relationship? The devil knows that too. Now think about this. I've done this once before, but I'm going to do it again. We always have new people. If I were to ask you, where on the planet would you identify as the Holy Land? What would you tell me? Israel. I heard a wave. Yes. And if I was to say, where in Israel would you describe the Holy City? What city? Jerusalem. Okay. And where in Jerusalem is the Holy Mount? What's it called? Mount Moriah, sometimes called Mount Zion. And on the Holy Mount, they've got the Holy Temple. At least they used to. And in the Holy Temple, they had the Holy Place. And then just beyond the Holy Place, they had the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies, they had the Holy Ark of the Covenant. You know, the word holy is used for all these things. And in the Holy Ark of the Covenant, there were some rocks. And in those rocks was a writing from God, the truth. And the word holy appears one time in the Ten Commandments. It's like a, a bullseye on the planet, friends. God made a time holy for us. The seal of God is in the law of God. Those that really love God, it's easier for some people to give God their money than their time. I've gone, had people go through meetings like that and they say, you know, Pastor Duck, what you said about the state of the dead makes sense. What you said about hell makes sense. But when you start teaching the Sabbath truth, they start to shift from foot to foot and they get a little nervous because it's not just believing it up here. It's now making a change in their life. And they go, ooh, that'll mean I do things differently. And that, that's where the commitment comes in. Amen? All right. The fourth commandment features all the components of a seal. It's got the name of the Lord, the Lord, Creator. The Lord made His territory, the heavens and the earth and the sea. The Bible says in Revelation 14, 7, the same thing you find in the fourth commandment. Worship him who made, he's a creator, the heavens and the earth and the sea. A message goes in the last days, these three angels take a message to the world before Jesus comes in Revelation 14, 14. He's coming in the clouds. What is part of that message? Come back to the creator, return, keep his commandments. That's also in Revelation 14. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God is calling His people back. Jesus came to save us from what? From sin. What is sin? Transgression of His law. Now, I, I don't want to sound like a legalist, friend. I'm saying that don't fool yourself. If you're living a life of sin, you need to be repenting of your sins, turning to Jesus, asking for grace and power to live a new life, and He will give it to you. He's done it for millions of others. He'll do it for you. Worship him who made. Number eight, what is the mark of the beast? All right, brace for impact. It says in Ezekiel 22, verse 8, You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbaths. Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They start talking about the religious leaders. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy. God calls that day holy. They've not made known the difference between the clean and the unclean. We've told you about what's clean and unclean even when it comes to food, right? Preachers don't do that anymore. But your body is still the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen? They've also hidden their eyes. That means it's there. They know it's there, but they hide their eyes. From my Sabbath. What are they hiding their eyes from? They hide their eyes from my Sabbath, so I am profaned among them. So the mark of the beast is almost just the antithesis of the seal of God. Instead of it being the laws of God, it's a law of the beast. Follow me, follow me. 
Daniel chapter 3. The government says you must worship the image or be killed. The Jews that were faithful there would not bow down because that would mean breaking the second commandment. Daniel chapter 6. The king says you must pray to only me or be killed. Daniel will not do that because it means breaking the first commandment, not having other gods. Here in the last days, it's the same issue, except it's going to be revolving around the fourth commandment. The devil hasn't changed. He wants to compel the world, and he's so sneaky. He's not saying, I'm not saying don't keep any day. Keep it, just don't keep the day God says. Does that matter? Don't keep the seventh day that's God's day. Keep the day of man, the sixth day. It's interesting that uh, the number is 666. Or no, I mean, they, they want you to keep the first day, the day of man. Man was made on the sixth day. They'll fix that in editing. I'm not worried. <laughs> Let me give you some quotes from history here. And this is from C.F. Thomas, Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Baltimore. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. That act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. It's interesting. They use the word mark. They said, we changed the Sabbath. It wasn't done by the apostles of the early church. It was done by a corrupt religious organization and most Protestants still follow. Now, don't miss me, friends. There are many spirit-filled people that love the Lord in Catholic and Protestant churches that are going to be in heaven. They don't know. God winks at their ignorance. You with me? But he's calling people in the last days to come back to the word. Reverend Peter Guinum The Convert's Catechism. If you are learning to be a good Catholic, you've got to go through the Catechism. It's question and answer format. Here's the question. Which day is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Friends, this is a Catholic Catechism. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Then obviously you'd have another question, which is, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred. That's the word for changed the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Did they do that based on the Bible? No. St. Catherine's Catholic Church Sentinel, 1995. This is more recent. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. They're wrong. It's actually more like the third century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Not from any direction noted in the Scriptures but from the church's sense of its own power. People who think the Scripture should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. That's what the Catholic Church says. I say, thank you very much. That's, I couldn't agree more. But they freely admit there is no Scripture that tells us to do that. These are man-made laws. Now, I'm watching the clock, and I've got to pace myself here. I don't have time to read you. I've got, I've got pages of quotes from leading theologians, not members of my church. For example, Alexander Campbell, a great theologian you've probably heard of in the Christian Baptist. He said, the first day of the week is commonly called the Sabbath. This is a mistake. The Sabbath of the Bible was the last day preceding the first day of the week. The first day of the week was never called the Sabbath anywhere in the entire scriptures. It is also an error to talk about the change of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. There is not any place in the Bible uh, any intimation of such a change. It's not in the Bible. I could read John Wesley. I could read uh, T.C. Blake. Here's a good one from uh, Dwight Moody. You've all heard of the great evangelist Moody. The Sabbath was binding in Eden. It's been in force ever since. The fourth commandment began with the word remember, showing the Sabbath already existed when God wrote the law on the tables of stone at Sinai. How can men claim this one commandment has been done away with while they admit the other nine are still in, in uh, effect? Dr. Edward T. Hiscox, he wrote the Baptist Manual, great theologian. He says, There was and is a commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day, but that Sabbath day was not Sunday. It'll be said, however, with some show of triumph, the Sabbath was transferred from the seventh to the first day of the week. Where can the record of such a transaction be found? Not in the New Testament, absolutely not. It seems to me unaccountable that Jesus, during three years of intercourse with his disciples, often conversing with them upon the Sabbath question, never alluded to any transference of that day. 
And during the 40 days after his resurrection, no thing was intimated. I just I go through Bishop Seymour. We've made the change from the seventh day to the first day, from Saturday to Sunday, on the authority of the Holy Catholic Church. This is so clear in history, but you don't hear churches talking about it because it's an inconvenient truth, if you don't mind my quoting that. The papacy enacting doctrine recognized the first day of the week as Sunday, and uh, they pa passed by the seventh day as the Sabbath. Uh, I don't know if you've got this slide here of the Ten Commandments. I captured this uh, online. Yeah, she got it up there. I, I just gave this to her this morning. Thank you, Cheryl. This is a picture of the Ten Commandments in front of a Catholic church. You'll notice that the second commandment is missing. They completely take out the commandment about idolatry, and then they preserve ten by dividing the tenth commandment about coveting. And um, then they say, you know, just remember the Sabbath day, the seventh day is the Sabbath, but they must think that Sunday is the seventh day. How many people have you have you met people that thought Sunday was the seventh day? I meet them all the time. Sincere Christians, they thought, well, yeah, I keep the seventh day as the Sabbath. That's Sunday. And they say, wait, the Bible says Jesus rose the first day. How can it be both? Number nine, how are people marked by the beast? He causes both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads that no one might buy or sell except the one that has the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of the name. You know, it says in Jeremiah 3.3, 3, you have a harlot's forehead, and you refuse to be ashamed. You remember we were talking about mystery Babylon the harlot last night. And what does she have in her forehead? Mother of harlots. Pushing idolatry on people. The beast power is going to compel people to receive it, or they can't buy or sell ultimately a death decree. And that's Revelation 13. Now, what's going to happen, friends? There's going to be some triggering crisis. It could be, we're, we could be on the threshold of this right now. I mean, when the United States is moving warships to the Middle East and to the Persian Gulf and Mediterranean, and there's a war between Russia and China's rattling its swords over Taiwan, and they're in cooperation with North Korea and Iran. I'll tell you, friends, this is how it looked before World War I and World War II. You know what people do when they're frightened? They become very spiritual. And people are willing to comply with spiritual laws when they're afraid. I don't know what the catalyst will be. An economic disaster? A war? Another plague? All three at once? Could happen. And the, the powers of the United States, which is that second beast in Revelation, is going to work together with the other religious powers of Europe and the Catholic Church and they're going to say God is punishing the world because we're disobeying him. We need to get back to the Bible. And they're going to start compelling a form of religion that is unbiblical. And it won't happen overnight, but it'll happen. And during that time of trouble, we're going to have a chance to preach the truth at the risk of being persecuted, mocked. Jesus said, you'll be brought before kings and rulers to make a defense for your faith. And you'll have to know how to open the Bible and show them what you believe. And those that do not cooperate... Finally, it'll get so intense as these plagues and calamities around the world get worse and worse, they're going to blame everything on us. It's like Ahab pointed to Elijah. He says, you're the trouble of Israel. You've called this global warming. That's what Ahab said to Elijah. Three and a half years of famine. And he says, you caused it. And Elijah said, no, you, because you're disobeying the Lord and your wife and her harlotries. Same thing, friends. It's going to happen again. And we'll be told we cannot buy or sell. We've got a choice. Peter said, do we obey God or do we obey man? It's not going to be popular. Jesus said, all that live godly will suffer persecution. Number 10, when are people marked by the beast? Is anyone got the mark of the beast now? No. Are we saying that people that go to church on Sunday have the mark of the beast? No. But when it becomes an issue, when it says the image of the beast should speak and cause, when it becomes compulsory and people say, I'm going to cooperate with the beast for benefit. They'll be receiving the mark of the beast. And ultimately, there's a death decree. Number 11, what is the ultimate fate, or fates, I should say, of those within the seal, or with the seal of God and those with the mark of the beast? Well, praise God, those that have the seal of God, 
Blessed are those who do His commandments that they might have a right to the tree of life. Don't you want to eat from that tree, friends? Eternal life and enter in through the gates of the city. And Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's one group. There's only two groups. The other group, the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. Now that does not mean it continues to ascend up. It means it ascends up out of sight. Like the fire that came from the furnace that Nebuchadnezzar made. Like the fires that burnt Sodom and Gomorrah. It says it ascended like the smoke of a furnace up out of sight forever. The wicked are going to be punished. Two rewards, friends. There's only two choices. Jesus said, if you are not with me, you are against me. I'm hoping that you'll choose today to be with him. Here is the patience of the saints, the endurance. Jesus said, he that endures to the end will be saved. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I'm so glad that we are on Revelation 14, verse 12. He wants you to have that experience, friends. He wants you to have that joy. Your faith in Jesus will give you a faith of living a holy life here on earth. He can make you a new creature. God will never ask you to do what you cannot do. Now, I'm going to make an appeal for those that are here today. And I want to tell you in advance that I'm going to make an appeal for those who are watching. We're going to turn to our closing hymn. It's number 292. And I invite you to stand says, Jesus, I come. Our singers are going to come out at this time. We're going to sing the first verse. And then I'm going to ask those who would like to respond. If you would like to make a decision to either return to the Lord or come, then I want you to come. You who are watching can do this in your hearts as well. to make an appeal if the Holy Spirit has spoken to you today or through this series and you know the Lord is calling you and you know it's time to make that decision to say I want to be with Jesus I haven't been living for him but I want to come to him I want to accept his mercy forgiveness his new heart I want his law written in my heart I'm going to invite you to come to the front because we want to have a special prayer for you you might be thinking Pastor Doug why are you doing this publicly because everybody Jesus called he called publicly and he died for you publicly you cannot be ashamed of him don't worry about the people here they're all sinners too if you hear the Holy Spirit come calling you you come some of you have never been baptized some of you young people you know you need to make that decision come now as we sing verse 2 and we're going to be having a special prayer you can make that decision who are watching of my shameful failure and loss, Jesus I come, Jesus I come, into the glorious gain of thy cross, Jesus I come to Jubilant 
another verse. I think there's some of you out there and some of you watching, you might be struggling. You're feeling a battle going on in your heart between your Jesus and your devil. You, you, you're afraid of what the consequences are, what the battle will be of turning your life over to Christ. Do you want the alternative? Do you want the wrath of God, eternal loss? Are you waiting for a better time? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Now is the accepted time. Jesus is calling. No better time than now when you hear his voice. As we sing verse 3, come, make that decision today. We'll pray for you. Uh, Don't be afraid. Come up to the front. Our uh, AFCO graduates here are going to be giving you a card. If you'd like to express interest in baptism or rebaptism, that's part of making that decision. You who are watching, you can make that decision at home. And you can go to our website and you can mark your interest and contact Amazing Facts to continue studying and we'll follow up with you. You know, as Jackie's playing, I, I think there may be still some here. You need to return to the Lord. You know the Lord's been speaking to you and you've wandered away. Why don't you come now and we can include you in that prayer. You may want rebaptism, maybe not, but you want to use this moment to say, Lord, I, there's something in my life and I know I need to get a new beginning. Come now. We're living on the threshold of eternity. Amen? We're going to go off the air praying with the people here. We'll also be praying for you who are watching. I want to remind you, please go to the Pinnacle of Prophecy website or the Amazing Facts website. Keep studying and we'll look forward to seeing each of you face to face in God's kingdom. Amen? God bless you. Let's pray.